Vietnam, Charlie Harris, 1st Infantry Division. I interviewed Charlie on November 29, 2006 in Abington, Maryland. Charlie used to pick me up at the airport and take me to where I was doing my interviews. Had no idea he was a Vietnam veteran and found out he was and I said I got to interview, Char in interview you Charlie. Charlie got two bronze stars in Vietnam. He's one of my unsung heroes. Went to the wall with him, the Vietnam Wall, the first time he was there. There's a picture of him on the website here. But this is another one of my favorite interviews and I'm honored and happy to bring you Charlie Harris on this edition. Talk about Vietnam, man. Probably, okay. What what year did you go to Vietnam, Charlie? I went to Vietnam in Don't be 19... Don't speak up. Just talk in oh. your normal voice. Okay. Okay. In 1968, uh -huh. that was the year that I went to Vietnam, I went to military in October of 1967. But it was a short two... It was two years. But in the two years, they crammed it all at me in one time to get ready for basic training. Uh, basic combat training, and then advanced individual training, which was no more than just guerrilla war, warfare tactics and uh, learning to survive in the jungle in Fort Polk, Louisiana. At that time, we didn't know what we were preparing for, but they pushed it so fast because what we st everybody was beginning to talk about the Tet of 68. You've probably heard about that. So in 60, the last of 67, we were one of the in April of 68, I went into Vietnam. That's when we went to Vietnam. After they crammed us, a lot of training, a lot of jungle training out of Fort Polk, Louisiana. And we went over there to prepare for the, for the Tet of 68. At that time, uh, we didn't know it, but they were building, they were beginning to cut off the food supply of the Viet Congs. And we were building up, they were building up for the big Tet Offensive. So we became, I was assigned to the 1st Infantry, the 2nd Battalion, 2nd and 16th, 2nd Battalion, 16th Infantry, 1st Infantry Division, which they called the Big Red One. Okay, so we took a short seven days after seven days just penetrating out through the jungle, walking around through there. Let's, let's go back a little bit. Let's, let's, okay. let's, let's kind of lead into Vietnam. Tell me, how old were you when you went into Vietnam? Okay, going into Vietnam, I was like 20 years old. Okay, I was, well, when I went over, I was 20 years old. What, what, what was the mood of, of the country and uh, how did you feel about going to Vietnam? Well, it, going to Vietnam, I didn't have really, things happened so fast, it matured and progressed so fast when they called me, you know, when I was drafted, I was working a job, I got out of school, I was working, never, uh, never thought about going to Vietnam, the war, I heard about it, listened to it vaguely on the radio, TV, but then the day came, I got off from work and there was a letter in the mail that says, Greetings, <laughs> you know. I was, I went in shock. It was like, I, it was like I went. In, I was, you know, I was saying military, you know, but still not thinking Vietnam. Basically, I'm thinking just in the army. So, uh, that within three weeks' time, I, in October, October the 31st, that's when I was inducted into the United States Armed Forces. And eight weeks later, I went through basic training. Eight weeks later, that's when I went into the advanced individual training as uh, uh, at Fort Polk, Louisiana. That's where we took all the jungle training, and uh, that was the closest thing to really the jungle around in the area was Fort Polk, Louisiana, in the bayous. So we went down there, took with training that they could cram down us in eight weeks, and eight weeks, thirty days leave, come home for thirty days, right straight to Vietnam. Just one second. I want to raise my camera just a bit. You're doing good. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, so you're 20 years old and yeah, 20 I mean, years old. I mean, you're going, you're going to Vietnam. Tell me, when we were driving up in the car, you said you went through it so fast, and then they stuck you in the pit of hell or whatever. What, yeah, what, what yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, that was. You know, we went through training, they crammed, that was that training that they give us. They crammed that down our throat, you know. What's the spirit? The spirit of everything that we did, the spirit of everything was to kill. And, you know, that's what, you know, what is the spirit of hand to hand, you know, to kill. That makes you what? A killer, you know. This is, you know, just installing this in our mind, you know, and uh, being part of learning, uh, uh, gaining confidence, uh, confidence in yourself. That's what it was, it bought us confidence to get ready for the jungle. And we was out there in the, uh, at Fort Polk, like I said, in, that, um, in the boonies and the bayouts. So when I got to Vietnam, so when we got to Vietnam, that the pits of hell was still was in the jungle, what I would refer to the pits of hell as the jungle, living in the jungle, going out in the jungle. Within seven days, as soon as we got in country, we were assigned a weapon. And uh, oh, when we was coming in, you could see the smoke from the airplanes, but still not aware of what it was down there. We're just looking down there, and you see it look, look like little pockets of smoke here, smoke there. We didn't know what it, I didn't know what it was. You just look, and it's all brand new. So we sat down in Xi'an, South Vietnam, and Xi'an Air Base. And once we got there, we were signed. What first thing you got was a weapon. Mm -hmm. They give you the M16, M16. And shortly after, well, Within two days, we was going out, just going out on the perimeter. I ventured out on the perimeter for maybe about seven at night, just adventuring out at nighttime, just going maybe yards out, setting up ambushes. Did, but didn't not realize, not even realizing what I was doing, what we were doing. And within that, after seven days, that was like a basic introductory or introductory into the country. Then we were assigned into our units. Hold on, just a second, okay. I'm gonna have to turn. Can I turn off that air cooler? He show me. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Turn it down. Well, because it's picking up on the camera. Oh, 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 oh. Well, turn it. Yeah, yeah. Turn it. Uh, you know where how to do it. No, nah, he don't mind. Right. And, you see. Oh. You turn. Did you just turn it turn off? off or you turn it on the air? You turned it on the air. So it has some air. You got to make sure it's on off. If you if it gets cool back here because it's damp, if it gets yeah. damp because it gets damp, if it gets damp, turn it back on. Yeah, it's okay. Just makes everything yeah. picks up on this camera. Oh, That's sensitive. Why I really make sure we try to keep it quiet. Yeah. If people are out there talking, up, it picks up yeah. everything. But we're okay now. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about Vietnam. Do you remember when you first got to Vietnam? I mean, how, was it what you thought it would be as far as the country? What do you remember mm. about first stepping off the plane wherever you were and, and going in country? The smell. That smell in there, it's a smell that, I never forget, that I'll never forget if I live to be 100 years old, that smell in Vietnam. Uh, it was between smoke, it smelled like smoke, burnt, everything seemed to smell like it was burnt when I stepped off that plane. Everything was like a hate dust, it was like a lot of dust, hate but not knowing what it was at that time. That's just the way it was in the country, you know what I mean, with everything that was going on in there. And they did a lot of burning. It was a lot of burning going on. They just burnt everything. So that was all. It was all in the atmosphere. The smoke smelled just, oh, just a raunchy smell, if you know, you know, raunchy smell. Then, well, after that, I always remember that. Then it wasn't much they really did with us because they were, we was all prime when we went there to go and you know for jungle for jungle tra for jungle training to go in the jungle so what we did we uh they assigned us after seven days we the next day they put us into a, a, a group we went out on a perimeter just ventured outside the perimeter just then looked around and moved around looking for signs of anything then we stayed out we'd come back and 
we were, after seven days, we were assigned to our units. That's when everybody went to their own units. Myself, I went to the 1st Infantry Division. Mm -hmm. That's when I was assigned to the 1st Infantry Division. We packed up all my gear, jungle gear, jungle, everything jungle. Went on out with my M16. Once I got there, by that night, I went out with the 1st Ambush. I was assigned to a, a platoon. It was just a small uh, eight to ten, eight to ten man platoon. We just went out that night and we reconned the area. Went out, looked around, just looking around to see if we see signs or anything. This was part of, it wasn't a part of training, but this is for real now. But not realizing it, we hadn't made no contact. We were just outside the perimeters. And as time progressed along and progressed along, we were moving further and further out until there, we would go out, we went out, it was a baby, about after 30 days, we were out looking for signs and moving around. Then comes ambush, we set up, went out at nighttime, the air, and we set up, air, started set, beginning to set ambushes up to cut this food supply off. We had to cut their food supply off. This was all in a matter of uh, April, got in there in April, maybe around the 1st of June. Around the 1st of June, that's when we begin to ambush take a serious note on cutting that food supply off. We, had, we, we were like fresh in town. We had, we had learned techniques to, we were using devices at that time. The Starlight Scope was coming in to operate at night. And around June the 12th, June 30th, something like that, that's when we made, uh, we were self-involved in our first kill. We popped that ambush that night. And when we popped that ambush that night, it was like, all hell broke loose. I thought it was. We began to, uh, body count began to grow for us mainly at night. Where at night we would be out there in the mornings, we would be popping maybe get two or three kills a night. We would maybe kill two or three at night here or there along the way. But the people were cutting the right supply off shortly, slowly cutting their supply off. And that's all we had to do. Can you mention the Viet Cong now? That, that leads me to a question, we'll get back to where you were, but tell me a little bit about the enemy, who you were fighting and, and, and what type of enemy we were fighting. Well, who we were fighting, basically what, what we were fighting, those Viet, the Viet Congs were just the same, were people that just lived in villages. They, there were villages around, they lived in villages, but they were VC sympathizers, the Viet Congs were, where you had the Regular army, who they, they were for in the north, they were North Vietnamese army who was well trained, just like we were, ready to fight. But the sympathizers who was the Viet Congs, they would be out in the fields working, but at nighttime, and in the nighttime, they'd put their robes on, put the black pajamas on, and hats on, and they would go out and take the North Vietnamese army. They would take them food, take them food, sympathize, sympathize with them, you know, put them in base camps, per, uh, resupply them to keep them moving down. They had them here or there. That was part of our job to su su cut that supply off. So we begin, as we begin to knock maybe one or two off per night, that was Viet Congs, people that was going out sympathizing with the Viet, with, uh, Vietnamese army. So we, want, but at nighttime, they were carrying the AK-47s and we were just knocking them off, you know, picking them off random. And that was the beginning of the serious Tet offense. Then as time went by, within that, well, we, in the daytime, what we did, we would be out searching and destroying. And at nighttime, we would ambush. We would be LPing, listening, LPing is listening posts, and OP is observation posts. We'd, be, we'd see it was never no wind at night and day. We, we'd become proficient after we started making one or two kills a night and kind of got used to it. You didn't feel good at first. Yeah, after the first couple of times, but then we were in a position that we were making kills so regular that we never had time to even stop and think about it. You know, we were just consistently every night because every night we were ambushing, we was knocking on one or two. In the daytime, we'd pack up, we'd move somewhere, we would just move on foot, we'd S and D, search around, search and destroy, look for um, base camps. Uh, anything, any places that 
the uh, North Vietnamese would be able to re-up, to uh, give them strength to move on. And as time went along, as they, we, f we begin to find places like that, there are base camps, but as we, after, we found, after we found those base camps, we begin to see them booby traps around them. And they started putting mines around them. They began to protect them. That gave us a good indication. We, be, we were becoming more and more proficient at what we were doing too. And with the technology that we had, we were learning. And that gave us the, you know, that gave us the uh, indication when we saw more booby traps and mines that we had to slow down, we had to take a time, but they were under, we were putting them under pressure because they was trying to protect with their goods that they had. And we says, we're on the right track. We was calling meetings at CP, which is the command post at night before we went out. We would be calling meetings, update us what we, what we were doing, how we were doing, the way things were going. But so we all had an idea. But we, every night, and it got to the point where every night we was just so calm, we began to get confident in ourselves as we was that we was just going. We knew we were going out to make some kills. That's what we were. That's what we were definitely we were going out to kill. We weren't thinking about what we're going to do and all that at nighttime when we settle in. We were sitting there because we watched the trails at night. We were able, we were becoming more proficient. We were got to the point where we could even detect which way they were coming from, how many were coming, what time to pop that bush. And our body, as we become more proficient, our body count grew more and more in the division. And everybody was saying, how are they doing it? You know, well, we, we, be, we were strictly ambushed. That's when they started calling us the ambush battalion of the Big Red One. That's how we got the name, the ambush battalion. We were ambushed, so, our ambush had become so proficient and our body count so rose so fast that they called us, you know, you know, in the, in the whole division, they called us the ambush, uh, ambush battalion. And after they saw us when we came back, that's when we got the name during the 10th of 68, the bloody, from the big red one, they used to call us the bloody red one. We, that's, how, that's how that name come about. And uh, through the ambushes. So as time went by, we started cut their right supply off, weaken the enemy. We noticed that they were moving more in groups and more in groups. That means that they were trying to protect each other. They were want, they was coming to fight. They had to fight because they, you know, they, that was the purpose of cutting the food off, you know, to bring them out and open them. Bring it in the opening so we could, uh, they want to fight, bring it on. And it was the tent of, then they called, that's what they called offense, tent offensive because they were going, you know, the Vietnamese was going on the offense you know, to make a big rush at Saigon to try to overrun, overrun the cell, but he's trying to get there. And we were just cutting them off. We were finding one night, the biggest ambush we sprung off what was the night that we got ready to move out. It was just normal. We just figured we just going for a normal, go for a normal stroll to kill some, you know, to, to make a kill, make some kills and get through a night. But that night they call. Big meeting at the C at CP. You know, I I was gun I was a machine gunner at this time. I went went from uh, I was a machine gunner. I was one one, and they called for the machine gunners to come up there, and they was uh, we were adjusting you know adjusting everything that we were doing extra this extra that, and we were going deep into the jungle. We made air assaults. We may start, we had to make air assaults. So we were going with the M50. We were taking that M50 caliber. We were getting ready to hump that. We had to hump that down. I had to hump my 60. And I said, oh man, this is gonna be some heavy th heavy doings going on this evening, which it was, it was, which it was, we was building for something big. So that night, we, they pulled us back into the night NDP, which is a night defensive position. And that's not normal for us. You know, because we be out there in the thick of things. It's not normal to pull us back because it take us out. We can't. We couldn't get out of our mode. We were into that mode. You know, just body counts. That's all it was for us to do. And uh, so that night we made an air assault. That next afternoon we had a little had a meeting. We met and uh, determined what we was going to do, how we were going to be moving, maneuvering. And the next day, that next that next day, we stayed in, but we stayed in camp in our base camp. And that evening, we made an air assault out. When we made that air assault out, we packed up everybody, you know, saddle up. You know, when you say saddle up, that was put on your harnesses, 
everything that you got, we were going, but we always stayed in the jungle. But then we learned, that was home. When you say saddle up, we were saddling up. We was going out there where we lived best. No interference, nothing. We was out there doing a job. And we was getting it done. And we made an aerosol just before dark that evening. It was around 3 o'clock, hot. We made that assault. And when we came into our LZ, LZ, our landing zone, we sat down in there. I was sitting, I was on the floor beside the door gunner when the, when the uh, chopper was getting the door gunner. said, it's hot in here. He said, it's hot down in here. It's hot as hell down in here. Meaning that the LZ was hot. They started, we was receiving fire. So, I, so we was down maybe about 10, 15 feet, about 10, 15 feet. When we got to the ground, I'm thinking maybe this thing might get shot at the ground. You know, a helicopter might get shot. So I, I told my gun team, my assistant gunner and my ammo bearer, I said, let's roll out. About five or ten feet, you know, you hit the ground, pop smoke, mark your spot. But when we hit the spot, we hit the, we hit the ground. We hit the ground fighting that evening. We fought, and then the helicopter, we made it, we got in. Then the, the choppers had to go back. And make and bring more, bring more to team, more teams, and we was making a big air assault because we was going into some heavy, into some heavy fighting. But they didn't even give us a chance to get on the ground. They hit us and they, they disorganized us, and we hit the ground. We wasn't looking for no uh, LZ to be hot. See, so they threw us off. And so, well, the choppers they got everybody in, you know. But they made it took a little while. But in the meantime, we were taking pox shots, you know. It was like that pox shot, you know, and. Trying to get, you know, just, you are fighting. It was becoming a battlefield. So it was so hot down there. So we got the, everybody in. We fought a little bit, broke contact. Um, later on, I guess everybody was regrouping because we sure were. Maybe it was like about 6 o'clock that evening. We broke contact about 8 o'clock. We made contact again. Flares and everything, illuminations was in the air. You didn't know night from day because the sky, everything was just lit up. The sky was lit up and everything. Uh, so it was a stage, just battlefield, and we would just broke, made contact at six, broke contact, made contact at six, maybe about eight, about eleven o'clock, all through the night, break contact, make contact. Everybody was trying to get organized with us, and also the enemy was also, but they knew we was in the area because this is some jungle where nobody had been in, and they had, they were dug in so deep into the ground that you had to root them out. You know, you could walk right over top of them, and if they didn't make a move, they, you know, you wouldn't know they were there. So we were, we were in the area to stay. We were in there to do some operating. We were just in there to search and destroy everything. That was our goal. But it was so hot in there, we lost a few people that we had to pull back. We, we, pulled, we lost some men. We pulled back. We called B, B-52s, and they hit the area for maybe five, seven days, five to seven days. Uh, we threw some napalm, we threw napalm at them in the area. We threw that well, Willie Peter, that white horse was in there all down through, saturating everything. We was laying, we were laying back, just waiting, you know, we, we, was, we was operating, we were operating, but we wasn't going really into deep, really that deep in there to try to root them out yet because we used some of our air force, some of the forces that we had. We was just we were the grunts that went in and got the job done, you know, what I could say, searching and destroying and, when, when we, and just that was our job. And it was just like nobody was really there to control us. You know, it wasn't like back in the rear, in the rear, you know, to salute somebody or nothing like that. That was like the program. We wasn't trained for that. And it wasn't for, and the type of work, you know, guerrilla warfare it was, and the ty that type of work wasn't for everybody. Because I've seen a couple of the boys break down themselves, you know, when under the, when the pressure got on, it's pretty tough to see, you, you know, your friends go down and get shot, you know, they did, or heads off, arms blowed off, body blowed off, body parts. Sometimes you might not even know who it is. But that was the rule of war. But this was not even war. This was just a little cold conflict between the countries. Never didn't, never declared war. And we lost them. We, we took a beating over there. And so getting back, so what happened? And we made this contact, so we prepped the area. We call that prepping the area. That was a prepped area. We went into that area, and those Bay 52s had cradles so deep, you know, I mean, they penetrate down in the ground. They were so deep, but we went into those areas. I'm telling you, we, we met resistance. After all those cradles, we started going in there, searching and destroying anything we could find. We looked. We saw footprints after all that bumming and everything. We saw, we saw being experienced men that we were. 
we had trained, we was trained to be and, be and became proficient. We saw, first thing we saw was footprints running over top of them cradles. We looked to see they fresh footprints. So we, this was, but this is all brand new version ground and dirt. So we looking at these, we said to us, so what we doing, we started setting up our ambushes according to the footprints at night in the daytime we was OP and observation, just looking at nighttime. And at nighttime, we was ambushing, but during the observation, we was looking around, we was able to detect, see those trails. They was cutting new trails in there move, as they moved through on their fresh dirt. They were cutting new trails in there. We was able to detect which way they were coming. We waited, we had knocked one off here, a few, five or six here, 10 or 15 there. Then we seen that body count started coming like 25, 27 a night. This was good. We had, we, you know, we was, we had to, we was weakening the enemy. When we saw cradles, the cradles, they, we saw which way we were able to detect where they were crossing, where they were setting up, how they were coming across, uh, which way they were coming. So we had the devices, we were able to detect just how many were coming, like a radar, as they walked through, we headed on the ground. We had ground, headed on the ground, when they walked through, we would beep, beep. Every time somebody go through there, beep. And then we had them all set up around, so we was able to detect which way most of them was coming from this way, that way, north, south, east, northwest, which we call nine o'clock, eight o'clock, by the clock, we was going by the clock, whichever way it was, and we were in the center of it. So that was things that, you know, we become, you know, for me, more for me with that as time went on, being familiar with, the, getting familiar with the area. So we were a, just taking note, and with the fresh dirt, we were able to see that they were coming, they were moving in forces. We'd be, begin to detect that they were moving in forces. So what we did, we even let a few of them go through. You know, you wait for the big fish, <laughs> you know? That's what we did. We sat there and we, we let, it, let some go through. We didn't want them to know we, how heavy we was operating in the area. And that's when we began to see that there we're moving in bigger groups, high groups, you know, a lot of people. And when we detected that, we called me, we had to call that meeting at CNP, CP, command post, and we said, this is the night. The way they move, this got to be the night. We're gonna, this is gonna be a big night for us. And we, so we got all, we loaded up, we got everything all set, we had everything all set up. We set up on our trail just like we wanted. We put all our de devices out, we put them out. It took a couple of days to get set up. We, we reconned the area. We uh, checked the area, searched the area. Uh, we did every everything to, to make it perfect. Night, the night that night, we went in. Everybody knew we was gonna get the big one. We was gonna get the big stuff going on. You know, you can sense it because we had all become. We did. We all knew what was going on. We had all become proficient and well trained enough to know when we was gonna hit hit something big, uh, and we would just. But this night it was a feeling, and everybody didn't know didn't nobody feel good, because we saw what was going on, and it was like we got so we went out early, ate a good meal, went out early, we sat around, we sat around. You never move into your ambush spot until limited visibility, very limited visibility. But you're close to your area. You know we go and we sit around. It takes a long time to set up an ambush. We set up that ambush that night. It got dark, we moved in position. We sat there, we walked, we tied right, wire around our arms. One position here, we ran another wire down to the next position. They tied around their arm. Whichever way they come, we let each other know they were coming this way. Then we had the, we had the radar devices out to let us know how, they, how, they, how many, would, you know, to detect beep, beep, as they come through. And we'd always wait for, always wait for the main element that's how you get your body counts. You know, you, you wait, you, you know, you maybe have one or two, but you have a point man. Then you might have a man on the flank. They might have a man on the flank. But then let those 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 get through. Let them couple two, three go. But you want that main element. Get that main body in that ambush kill. Get them in that kill zone. It would interlock and fire because you had to have the interlock and fire. So we it was ten o'clock that night, everything quiet. 11 o'clock, everything quiet. 1 o'clock, everything's quiet. No, no, nobody come. They had to come. We had been cutting their food supply off because we had killed so many of them. But the people that we was killing, we did, things had got so bad that 
the Viet Congs, the women, even the little babies, they was car the little children that they were carrying, they had like maybe two, three grains of rice, you know, down in the maybe down in the diaper. That's that's the way they was trying to sympathize. Their sympathizers was trying to get food to them. They were starving out there. We hit them at the point that they were just they couldn't make it, and they had to show their face and they had to come bring it on. So, and we had a base camp out there. All the base camps we had them covered. But we had blew them up, and what we didn't blow, we had ambushes all around them that they couldn't know where they could get in. They had to come, and that had to come that night because the, the way the uh, the way they had been moving in big bodies. I mean, every night more and more, more and more people were coming down through the trails. The trails were bigger, so they had to come the night in big forces. And one o'clock come that morning, everybody just laid there on edge, but we was a hundred percent alert. We knew that uh, because we talked about it. And the captain, Captain Bishop says, man, so the later it got, the more edgy, edgy everybody got. Captain Bishop says, man, the hair on my back is standing, standing straight up on my back. He says, and he says, action tonight. And everybody felt it. Everybody could feel it. You know, everybody sensed it. But it was just a matter of time until he got there. They had to come. We wasn't going to move because we were, we, we were dug in. We, we weren't going to move until they came. And... It was so the sooner they come, the better we could go. Get it, we wanted to get it on, and uh, so like about five thirty that morning, we said, "Let's break some bush." You know, we're gonna break bush. We're gonna break bush, and we're gonna try to get to try. You know, maybe try a little uh, area, and uh, try another area away from that. Expand our bush. We get ready to break bush. All of a sudden, beep. Uh, uh, our radar device went off. Beep. Said, like, oh, something's coming, you know. Pull the chain, pull you know, pull your pull your arm. Got the you know next next position. Beep, has another one, you know. Uh oh, action! Everybody's nervous now because they, when they come, they're gonna come in waves. Action! Oh man! So, and all of a sudden, the radar started going beep, 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 beep. Oh man, them beeps are coming, and when they come, this is it. This is the moment. Don't spring too soon. That's that's what uh, Captain Bishop said. Don't spring too. He's gonna. He was the captain. See, he's and he he was right there in the center of the ambush. But he's gonna let the element, let the main element, get right in his kill in his kill zone, and that's when he spring it. But when he springs this ambush, it's, we got a whole foreign line. We got a foreign line down through there. We're gonna open up like a hail, like 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 a hail, like a hail hailstorm. So when he gets in there. They get when they get in the kill zone, all of a sudden, boom, man, they <clears throat> everything was disorganized. We got to hold our positions. The enemy was running around. We started, we started firing. We was gunning them down. You know, I had a machine gun. <laughs> we in a lock far, and you had your riflemen's. Your riflemen's they in a lock in a lock there far. The uh, automatic weapons, we in a lock out far with one gun on this end, one gun on this, on, on, on the right end, on the flank, and we in a lock far, so we got everybody in a lock far, they in a far, in a kill zone. In the foreign zone, you'll never get out of it because you'll never get out of it because the point that what, what, what we become successful in making kills, everybody always say, how do you do it? And was excited about trying to kill somebody. But that's not the way, that's, that, wasn't the, that wasn't the deal. We learned, we learned that if you disable a man, he's not going nowhere. But you disable him. You disable all of them out there. And in the morning, when the morning, when 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 the battle's over, you got them disabled. You hear them out there all night long. They're out there crying and moaning and groaning. They're disabled, but we don't move. Then when daylight come, that's when we search the area, search our battlefield, and we disable and kill everything that's out there. That's the only way you can do it. That's what we did. We had many battles. We had many battlefields out there. Uh, many by time after time, because like I said, it's, and as things got things progressed on, things even I was just one of the one of the nights that we had out there. As things progressed on, you know, we had a lot more, you know, a lot more battles time after time. I think that night, you know, the body count. Well, you don't really never have the real body count because what happened, you some of them drag some of them, some of the, some of them drag yourself off up under something you abundant it's thick in the jungle by being thick but you know you try to pile them up we've went out there and we've taken the enemy and was got them at night ambush you mean we search and destroy the area 
uh, search and destroy what's left of them. And what we do, we ambush them. Let, wait for them to see if anybody come and get them. If they come and get them, we get them too. Tell, tell me about some of the American casualties and were you around them? Were any of your buddies hit or wounded or killed? And just tell me a little bit about that, what you well, experienced. Oh, okay. What I experienced with my buddies out there with my buddies, we once you once you was once you was disabled in combat, if you wasn't on you, you was dust you got a dust off. They dusted you off, and nine times out of ten you never heard from them again. That's the way it was. We were just a group of men that got together. We met as we were assigned to a unit to do a job from all over the world, and being from all over the world, you know we got. Some we just met right there, but we didn't spend a lot of time getting to know nobody. We were strictly out there in the jungle. We were just what you could call like just lived in the jungle. We didn't spend a lot of time talking about home because something home, home is something that you didn't have time to dwell on. You didn't dwell too much on getting to know a person. You, you say buddies, but what buddy was somebody that you'd just be around. You know, somebody that would be, you know, that you'd be go out on ambush, you know, you'd be out on ambush with, you never knew his real, never knew any name. The only only thing everybody liked me, I was Harris, last name. You, you know, Capetto, you know, uh, McComas, any name, you know, whatever your last, whatever your last name is, that's who, that's who you was. And you see somebody, I see, when I see my buddies, people that I've I operated with, when I got, when I was dusted off, like the night I was dusted off, uh, we was in an ambush, and I got we were far apart. And that morning, about six thirty that morning, some for some reason the enemy, I guess they kind of felt like they would be out there all the time through the nighttime, but they'd move in big pockets early in the morning. It seemed to be like around between daybreak and eight o'clock. That's when they seemed like they would move, and we would be able to. We, after we detected that, we would hold our bush a little bit longer. We started staying in later and later because we said we're getting more, you know, we're getting more ambushes at nighttime, you know, at seven to eight o'clock in the morning. And sometime I'd see my buddies, what would you wouldn't even, sometime you might not even know somebody, your buddy was uh, even hit or wounded until somebody else tell you. Because, you know, you didn't know who was going on. You knew you were out there operating, you knew you were out there operating during your job. You don't know what position, you know, what position was wiped out, whether it was wiped out or hit. Enough, and I was, thank God, I was just one of the ones that they just didn't wipe my position out. I was down, but not out. And I, the morning, but the morning I got chopped off that morning, I seen my buddies, I saw Rantoria, I saw Marino. They were, they, they were uh, Rudy Rantoria. I didn't know his first name. He had, his neck was all, his neck was hanging off. I didn't know it was him. I got, when the, the, that captain, uh, Doc Bryce told me, said, someone said, Harris got to get a dust off. So I went out. They got. They took my uh, 60 from me. I had to keep a weapon with me all the time, so I drug out on, drug myself out there, leaned up where the dust off was going to set down, and I saw and some body, the bodies were out there. They piled up the dead bodies out there, and when they piled, once they got them piled up, I let, I went out there and got beside them, not realizing you know who it was. And I was just there waiting on the dust off to set down. He said, "You got to get out of here now because the dust the dust off is coming in, Harris. You got to get out of here." So. I said, man, I was all dazed anyhow. And when I got there, I laid right there. I got on that chopper. I got on the chopper. They threw the, threw the dead bodies on. The medic put me on there, got me on there. And I was I was over there. I said, oh, man, this is something down here, man. You're crying. And everybody was everybody was down there crying and nervous. Cause, man, we, had been, we was battling that morning. We was in a... We we was we was in a tough battle. We were taking a beating. That, that was the morning we was taking a beating. And... Uh, when I was in there, the dust out, uh, I heard the dual gunner, he hopped up in there with the medic and said, we gotta get the hell out of here. They was trying to knock the chopper out. See, the chopper was on the ground. Once the chopper on the ground, they wasn't really worrying about the men. They wanted to get that chopper, shoot that chopper down. And the chopper started going, I heard the dual gunner say, we gotta get the hell out of here. And uh, we started getting up. And I'm saying, oh man, I was sitting by the door, man. <laughs> it was, it's like, I never been something like you never been through nothing like this before. You don't know what you're gonna ever go through, uh, and you find yourself in a position that you know it's nothing you can do. You had a handicap, we was dusting off, and just as I was in there, my time it just wasn't my time because I was looking, looking out the door, and man, my boys was down on the ground battling it out. You know that down there fight. You know, I mean, the rage of far everywhere. Uh, uh, hand grenades lobbing back and forth just like snowballs, just throwing at each other because things, the combat had become so close. 
the fighting had become so close because it was right in the kill zone that they were trying to survive. You know, the Kong was trying to survive, plus they, they came in a big element. And they were knocking the heck out of our positions. And uh, so when I was sitting on the chopper, I looked up, I looked up, and a bullet came through the chopper. It was getting up, the chopper was coming up, was on its way, and, when it, and a bullet came right, right, just right through the chopper, right through, right in front of me. Zoom, I looked, that's the bullet hole right through. I said, oh my gosh, you know, I still out of declare. I'm thinking, they got to shoot, you know, and they were shooting, trying to knock this chopper. I'm thinking, oh my God, they're going to knock this chopper out of here. They're going to knock this chopper down, you know. They, when I knew they was trying to shoot it, I was there. Uh, so, but we was getting, but the door, I mean, the door gunner, he was firing back. The door gunner, he was firing back. They were fighting on the ground. And uh, we had over other overhead uh, secu uh, security over over here. They were fighting. Well, it was a it was a major battlefield out there. And if it got once we got up, we got out of sight. We got out of sight. We uh, once we got out of sight, I mean, well out of distance. We came on back to the rear. Well, within seven, within uh, I went back to the rear, stayed back there for a little bit, and recovery, a little bit of recovery. That was a purple heart, you know. And then within a, within another, within a few couple of weeks, I was back out on the battlefield. You know, the, I went back out there, oh, back in my unit. Went back in my unit. There we were. You know, there we were, back in combat, doing it again, going it, going at it again. This time, when I came out of this time, that well, the same battles going on, searching because that's what we were searching these street ambush. That's all we ever did. A lot of people would say they did this, they did that, they did uh, whatever they did, and I can't say they didn't, but it's not too much that I did over there, but just search and destroy, you know, that's why a lot of people say, you know, well, you know what, what was this, what was that. I wasn't around a lot of people. The only people that I was really around was my buddies that I fought and with that was under the same train, under the same condition that I was uh, under. And the people that we would be around was like people in villages. When we was in the jungle, when, but when we went into the villages, we were in the villages raiding. We were we'd going to raid the village because that's where the Viet Cong would be in there at nighttime. They put the roads on and go out there, and we'd be have to knock them off. And those people in the daytime, you see them out there with the holes and the oxes and everything, working the fields and the rice pat, rice dikes and rice patties. You know, work raid, working in the fields. This is all day. High GI, number one GI, laughing. But at nighttime, soon it get dark, they go in, they take all their harvest and everything, and they will go and take it out to VC, you know, put it in base camps for the Viet Cong, for the Viet Cong, for the Army, for the, for the NVAs, what we call the NVAs, North Vietnamese Army. They were sympathizing, they put it in a base camp, so when they come there, they have a place to supply, resupply, get food, and that was where we was doing cutting it off. So the only people around, we were around, and to be around people, uh, you know, for in, under any conditions, it wasn't, that was really wasn't us, because we we were trained to a level uh, to do this, to do a job, not to be around people. It wasn't really, they didn't really need us to be around people, because if we was around people, you know, that would take us off our level, you know, the, off our level that we were at because of the training that you was, that you had went through, the things that you had learned is the thing you have to have on your mind all the time. You can't go at that level out in the jungle and get you at that level, make, learn you to go out there and be, you know, to kill, say, say, say to go out there and kill and then to keep bringing you back, to bring you back, then tell you you can't do this, and then expect for you to go back out there another two or three days later or another week later. You can't just, it's not It's not meant to be like that. That's not the normal way of life for nobody to be that way. It's not the way, simple way of life to to just kill, just go out there and kill. You gotta be abnormal to do that. The things that we did, the things that we did was abnormal, but it was just in a position that we were in, the position that we were in, the conditions that we were in under, you know, we had to do it. And it was a thing that you had to adjust yourself to, but it just happened so fast consistently. That's what happens. Once you start doing something consistently, you'll do it and you stop thinking, you know, you, you have a tendency to stop thinking about it, what they wanted us to do. Get to that level of intensity. Don't worry about finding somebody to kill. We, have, we, we got somebody for you to kill because if, if we, our body count, when we begin, if our body count dropped down to maybe say at nighttime, 
our body counts dropped down to two or three. We, we got to the point at a foul level, dropped down to maybe three or four. We started killing maybe two or three people per night. They would move us, they'd shift us someplace else. That's, it's, that, they would shift us where our body count would go up because that's what we were doing, you know. We're, our body, you know, our, uh, uh, you know, we were ambushing. We were ambushing where other people sometimes, other units be out there and they would be maybe just moving around, but they would be looking to see like Lerps, the long range reconnaissance. They would go out there and be looking around for people to, you know, to see what kind of movement there was, let's say movement, what kind of movement, where the movement was, and uh, just maybe every now and then they might knock somebody off. But you see heavy movement, they would report that. And they would let us know, they'd turn it, they'd turn it over to the, to the ambush battalion. Tell me about your Bronze Star, what you did, and the citation for that. Oh, okay. Uh, we was at, it was a, a firefight. That was a firefight. You know, this is part of uh, uh, not knowing what you didn't realize. I didn't realize, well, things just happened. And we got in a fight. It was 6 o'clock in the afternoon. We were crossing a field. We were moving into an uh, ambush uh, position. It was three snipers was up in on the other side of the ambush, uh, on the other side of the battlefield. It wasn't really, it hadn't developed into a battlefield, but the field we were moving across. It was getting late. We was moving across three, three snipers, two or, it was two or three snipers. Uh, they opened fire on us. Once they opened fire on us, they knocked a couple of our guys out. I saw one of the guys, I didn't even know who it was. I, said, I didn't know who it was. He went down. Well, the first thing you do is go into the prone position. When you receive fire, you go down. You go into a prone, a prone position and you assume a position, you know, ready to fire far back, which we did. But we got pinned down. We were pinned down. And being, as being pinned down, I just, I just began to work with that gun, that, the machine gun. Being pinned down, I saw the fire, up, I saw a fire, come, detected fire coming from up in the tree line. And when he did, I was down. I just opened fall. I, I went, you know, just open fall up in there, spray, what you call spraying the area. I sprayed the area. It wasn't that many up in there. No, it wasn't, wasn't a lot. And when I, when I did that, I got up, I made an assault. I looked to my left, looked to my right, and I made an assault. And I went up there and flushed and flushed them on and flushed them out. And when I came back, and, and when I came back, my, my assistant gun alone, I told him, I said, come on, let's go, let's move. Because I had the gun, you know. And that'll pin you down, that big gun. When that big gun's opened up, everybody got to go down. That gives everybody a chance to go up, everybody a chance to advance. But I was advancing my sense. Instead of me staying there, I took the big gun and I went up there and I, and I, and I advanced myself and flushed them on and flushed them out of there. And that got me. Got I me mean, one of my bronze stars. I got two bronze stars. How'd you get uh, the other one? What would you do? The, the, I got the other bronze stars, say, in a far fight. In a far fight. Later on, we were in a far fight, and I pinned, it, I pinned the enemy down, and everybody made an aggressive move. Everybody made the aggressive move to come in on the sides, flush them out, and, and, to, and take them out, and took them out. So what did you do on the second bronze star? On the, yeah, it was the same thing with my machine gun. You know, the main is pinning them down, pinning them down and making a move, which normally a machine gunner don't make no advances. You know, he don't make advances. He, he pin them down. Everybody go down to the, the gunner's will. But the way it was with me, I was, uh, you know, like I guess I was just, you know, under, under condition that, you know, you just, you, you react. You know, I guess I, I was, I wasn't. I wasn't thinking bronze. So I wasn't thinking this. wasn't thinking that. But reacting, and you know, I was. I was just. Aggr I was just aggressive, moving in. You know, moving in with, in with the big gun. Put the big gun under here, because normally you, you have a tripod on that. You fart. But you see, I would move in, and move in on the enemies, uh, on all the enemies, and pin them down. See, and make it possible for every for those riflemen, the automatic riflemen, to. Come in and make the kill on the second, the second bronze star. To make it made it possible for them to come in, and the snipers once they get up, give the sniper that option. You know, sometimes we have we have sniper teams too. They had M14s, the old M14s. Yeah, that was our sniper. They was proficient with that. I remember a couple of a couple of good guys that we had. They would we would be out there, and uh, 
Sometimes the enemy, like I say, flush. When we when we flush, they'd come up, and those snipers, they would, you know, would, they would disable. You know, we weren't trying to kill. We never tried to kill nobody. That's it. It wasn't the idea is not to kill. The thing is to disable and then kill. Once get them down, you can kill them ten hours later. You can kill them the next day. You can kill them the next morning. He's just down there. You know, he's not doing it. He might just die while he's out there moaning and groaning. That's the only thing. That's the only thing at nighttime. If you get him one, two o'clock in the morning, see, we don't, we don't bust, but uh, we don't break that bush. We just stay right in that position, and he'll lay down, moan, groan all night long. You, you know, just. Mm. Uh, you know, just any way he moaned, in pain, all that. But there's nothing nobody can do. Unless we can get it, unless we can throw illumination up, light the sky up, and can see. And we get our sniper over there, and boom, 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 boom. Drop an 18-round magazine in his head, you know, in it right there, right in his temple. And his brain will pop right out. that put him out of his misery. That's we do. Well, you know, we, if we could sing, but if not, it's going to be that's what's going to be done in the morning anyhow, because uh, that's just the way it's, the, the rules of war. It's, rule, it's war. Did that bother you after the war? All the, the memories of what killing people, did that bother you at all? Some of the Vietnam Being involved. Are, are trouble today. Are you, did that ever happen to you? Well, I think about it a lot. But I think about it all the time. It's a part of your life that you don't never. You, you know, something that you never done before, you never do it again, so it's abnormal. You know it's abnormal, you think about it a lot. I don't really get involved in uh, talking with a lot of people about it a lot because it's something that nobody can understand because they, uh, you know, you, you just can't, it's not normal for a person to comprehend living a life like that and doing things like that, the things he was doing there. And, you know, people say, oh, yeah, is that right? You know, you did that, you did this, you did that. But that's just, uh, that's just, a matter. I, I look at it as a matter of figure of speech for them to say that because they can't, you know, you can't understand, you can't comprehend how it is. Myself, for me, somebody, just, for me to ever thought that I'd be involved in something like that, to be a part of something like that, what I did over there, I would have never in a lifetime thought that I'd ever be in, doing anything like I did over there, nothing to that, not even close to enough, that it just shows to show you never know in life what your capabilities are until you really put in front of it, and put it until it's put in front of you. But uh, with, with me, with being, when being over there, you know, it's, I mean, it's uh, something that I would never give, I'd give no, I wouldn't give nothing for the, for the experience that I had. But I really wouldn't want to ever do it again. I don't even know if I'd be able to do it. I guess I probably could, but it's something that I couldn't just jump in and do it. Just today, I'd have to prime myself, you know, say, get, you know, something you have to get you have to get your mind right to uh, uh, get your mind right. Something you have to something that you can't weigh on and think about because if you think about it, you're gonna get you you you'll very easily get killed dwelling on something about. You can't think about home, you can't think about nothing but just for the moment because that's what you're living for that moment. And it's not where you want to be, but it's where you wind, where you wind up being because when you left, when I left home, you didn't even, I didn't even know where I was going. I was going to Vietnam, that's all. I didn't know what, I, you know. I knew I'd be in uh, infantry and I was trained for this and all that, but training, even with the training and everything, you know, you don't really put yourself in that position. You don't know what, predicaments are going to be that you put that you're in they give you simulate situation that you may be in sometime but you never you never realize uh, uh how it is until you bit till, till i was there were there and, drugs in vietnam uh yes it was there was a lot of well i'm not going to say drug a lot of drugs but i guess it was too but mainly it was marijuana it was the, marijuana was the, was the choice of drug over there it grew out there it was a wild plant uh, we we uh, killed a few Chinese. We had some Chinese over there. Those people were hard to kill. I'm telling you, they were big, hard to kill. We killed a few while we were there. The reason why I said it was hard to kill because when we after we search them, at, well, during the search and destroy, they had valves of uh, opium. They used the opium, and because some of the Viet Congs did too, the Vietnamese and the Congs and all that. They had little valves of opium with them. They chewed it liquid, and they had liquid opium. And 
I guess when they had that, when they had, when they was using the opium, I guess they used it all the time. That would just gave them a, a more power because they would be coming at you sometime. We would just sometime we we would when we killed them Chinese, they would still they'd be dead, but they'd be just nerves would be just. Uh, yeah, I guess it was just, and then they had them big valves of opium on them, so they said that was just nerve from the from the opium, I guess. And they probably used that, they probably used that as a medication, something to alleviate the pains, uh, uh, assuming, you know. But it was, the drugs was down, like I said, but the more major drug was marijuana. I think everybody tried it or smoked it or something like that over there. Again, but in the field, like out there in the jungle where we were, we uh, we saw it, but it was you know we we saw it, but it was we wasn't really around people that and we we killed people that had it, but we weren't really around. Didn't have really time to really get involved in that because we were again we were around ourselves and we were constantly moving. We were we were on the move twenty four seven, no timeouts. You know everything con consistency. Was out, you know, was what we were, what we were after, at consistently killing people, killing the enemy. We're just about out of time, but when you came home, did you get a homecoming, or did they curse you and call you baby killers? What happened when you came home? <laughs> what they did when we, when when we came home, I flew, we came back. I got my orders, came back to the United States. We flew back in. They sized us up for class A's because we came back in jungle fatigues. Came back, they sized us up for jungle. You know, took our size measurements for a class A uniform. And while while they were being tailored, they gave us a ticket to go down and have a steak dinner. And that was your welcome home. That was our welcome home, which was about 30, 40 minutes while you went down the street. They had a little cafeteria. It was like just a cafeteria uh, mess hall. You got one, a, a, a steak dinner. Um, you went back, got your fatigues. Once you got, I mean, got your class A's, showered, changed your clothes. I mean, put your fatigues on and everything, and you was ready to ship home, and they ready to ship, ship you home. And they shipped on back to, uh, back to Baltimore, came back to Baltimore. They offered me, made, wanted to offer. If I stayed in there for 30 more days, they would have I would have been ETS. I would have got out of the military when I came back. But I said, no, I'm going home. Uh, I'm going home and get it. Let me ask you a quick, couple quick questions. Did it bother you to kill people, or were you even in your own mind when you did that? When when it, when when I first started getting involved, I didn't have time to think about it because once they prime you, prime you, prime you with those uh, preliminary uh, ambushes that you get out there, you get out there, then all of a sudden, once you make the, once once you get out there and you start really start killing, you don't have time to stop because they got you in the environment. Uh, 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 the environment or is around you is to kill. The spirit is to kill, so it becomes a part of you. You don't stop to think about it. If you stop to think about it, you're going to get hurt. You're going to get killed. You're going to have somebody else is going to get killed. So you're going to have your mind off. Your mind will be off the of business. Off the business. So it really never. I never really never took the time out to think about killing. Then when it was all over, then I said, oh, man, you know, the way things are, you know, and I was doing this and I was doing it, like I say it now, you know, I was doing this the way you kill over that. That's not normal. You know, you think about it, but it's nothing I can do about it now, you know, and it was a job. So, but that's, what, that's the purpose of it. When they get you over there and get you in the situation, they will take, take you that level of intensity, intensity to kill. You don't have to worry about it because you don't have time to stop and think about it. What does the American flag mean to you as a veteran? That's a symbol. That's the symbol of the. That's, that's, that's the symbol of the United States. That means that's the flag in which we fought under, of our land, the home of the brave, the land of the free, the home of the brave. That's what that's what that flag is. Are you proud right to be a Vietnam veteran? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Now that it's over, all said and done. I probably, you know, like, see, I was drafted in the military. I was drafted. I probably would have never even went to military, went into military if it wasn't for the draft. But I was drafted, and now that it's all said and done, I'm proud that I was able to fight for the country, uh, for my country, and that's just the way it is, you know. Proud to be an American, you know. It made, it made, I think it made me a better man in the world, in the world, uh, just to be in a part, uh, learn, to get to know people, you got to know people, make friend, made friends, 
You know, even though it was just some, some of them were just for one, you know, one time for short periods of time, but that was just the way it is. And that was the way it is as I moved through the world in two years time. And it was just a, a quick two years, but it wasn't a lot. It wasn't a lot that I learned because the, the work that I did, it wasn't really the kind of work that that was going to help me when I came back, when I came back out into the world. One more question. What, what should people remember about Vietnam? But the thing they, uh, to what they most should remember is about Vietnam is the men. They always want to think about the men and say a prayer for the men in Viet that died in Vietnam. All the people that we lost in Vietnam during that conflict because it wasn't even a war. It, was a, it, was, it wasn't a war. We called it a war. We said it was a war, but it was just in all, all situations, it was just a conflict. War was never declared. You been back to the wall in Vietnam, in Washington, the Vietnam Wall? No, I haven't been back. I never went down to see the wall. I haven't been down there. It's just that everybody, a lot of guys said, a lot of friends said, come on, go down. But I said, eventually, when I'm ready to, I'm going to go down there and uh, see how I feel down there. I'll look at my, look, I'll, I'll just go look, see all my friends, you know, see what names are on there. I want to go down there. I'll probably, go, I'd like to go down there. When I do go, I'll go like early in the day. And I won't tell nobody I'm going. I'll go down by myself because it'd be just my own little reminiscing. And I'll go down there and I want to go down the next day, go down there and, and just look and see the names that I can find on there because I have to go by last names, you know, because I know a couple about some by first names, but I'll have to look and see what names and see who didn't make it because I'm sure some of the guys that didn't, uh, that I left out there didn't make it. Some of them did, some of them didn't. So I'd have to look, I want to look on the wall and just spend a day just looking and reminiscing. One more and thing. When I tell you, I want you to look in the camera and give me a salute, okay? From where you're seated. Mm -hmm. Okay, when I tell you, okay? Before I run out of tape, I want to make sure I get this on there. Okay, right into the camera, Charlie. Okay. Go ahead. Got it. Good. Okay, hold on. Just, just stay there for a second.